right. What's up, everybody? We're back with Greenwich House once again on a rainy Wednesday night in Chicago with your host, Lori Branch, and Nick Fall, aka Mega. And guess who's in the house tonight? Hey, Larry hey. Hunter. Woohoo! DJTH. Mega, what's up, brother? What's up? T. You know this guy? <laughs> Do he know me? Dude. No, I said, do you know Kevin? Oh, I do. I uh, do you. My Who brother. doesn't know Kevin, right? Who doesn't know? I am a humble servant. <laughs> Who doesn't know DJ Terry Hunter? They, if they don't, something wrong with him, right? Hey, That's right. They may not. Let's educate them. Let's DJ hey. <laughs> record label owner, producer, CEO, producer. DJ producer. Uh, he does it all. So we want to thank you all for tuning in. We're going to have a, a nice long chat with Terry Hunter, one like I hope you've never seen before. We uh, like to unpack things that haven't been unpacked in other places. And let's talk about what's happening in the world today. So uh, Terry's got a big voice. I know that, uh, and, and he's very prolific. So I know he has a lot of things going on in his mind. But let's, let's just start with like what's happening with this pandemic. How are you handling it? Whew. Um, good now. I think I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm used to it. Um, uh, it's, it's our new reality. So mm -hmm. with that being said, um, you have to adjust. You have to, you know, us as entertainers, DJs, producers, musicians, you know, we have to deal with the cards that we're dealt, so to speak. And I like to try to analyze things and get in front of things and then stop worrying about it and just go. We're here, it has been a rough road, you know what I mean, for everybody. And it's tough to see a lot of our friends um, that's in the business and across the world uh, mm -hmm. not figure it out. And I don't think anybody has figured it out yet. I think we're all trying to figure out, we're trying to do a little of this, a little of that, and kind of see what sticks. No one has completely figured it out yet. Uh, not even the, 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 the world. So mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say that, that we just got to go with the flow, you know? How, how yeah. much of it is incorporated into the artistry and the creativity? That's what I'm, uh, I'm curious to know. Yeah, like a, a lot right now, like I said before, like in the beginning, right when we got hit um, in March, it was so funny. I was supposed to go to, uh, to England and um, I was hearing about the pandemic stuff or the coronavirus. They was calling. They hadn't even started calling it uh, mm -hmm. COVID nineteen. But I was in February. I was in Dominican Republic, tying up loose ends for what was supposed to be my birthday celebration in 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 Dominican Republic. And then came home for a few days, and then that's when it was starting to really get crazy. And I was headed to England, and then. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, I mean, like I was on my way there. And then when they announced, yo, you're going to have to stay over there and be quarantined for a couple of months. I mean, a couple of weeks. I was like, oh, no. So I just started watching everybody, you know, pop up doing streams. A few people have been doing streams before. And I was just like, nah, this don't feel right. So I'm just going to sit back and figure out what to do. And, um, you know, make it happen. And then I just watched people and I was like, I want to go on for a, a reason, a purpose, a cause. And then about a month, month and a half later, we was, me and my team sat down and we figured it out. And if anybody remember when I first started streaming, my first set of streams was I was giving back. I felt like that I had to give back. Um, the, we did one. I think my very first stream was with, we raised money for the Frankie Knuckles Foundation. And then after that, me, Frederick, um, Alan Wayne and the Chosen Few, we got together and we mm -hmm. got the marker for Ron Hardy that has not been done since he's been passed. And, and, mm -hmm. and I want to give people an update on that. We got a lot of information coming soon. It is done. Uh, we are planning a trip down there to document everything. Um, I'm super happy. Shout to the Hardy family for that. And that's kind of what I was doing. And then the week after that, I hooked up with... Um, um, Josephine's Cafe on 79th, and then what we did was we did a food drive and we fed 200 people, 200 senior citizens, and I was doing that through just all of my streaming. I just didn't feel like 
what we were going through, we didn't know what it was. And I just wanted to use my platform in the beginning to make it about someone else, to help someone else first. And that's what we successfully did. You did. You've been very, very generous, Carrie. And that doesn't surprise me. You have a very generous spirit. You really exude just positivity. I think that's why so many people are attracted to you and your energy and your music. And so I, I want to say thank you. Half of everybody is, is we appreciate, you know, the example that you, we really appreciate it. It's a model how we need to be in this pandemic that we've got to pour into each other, Absolutely. love and compassion and, and in a way that we haven't had to do before. And, and I know it's tough, especially for a full-time producer, CEO, DJ, you know, this, 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 your, your bread and butters in, in yeah. being out, you know, so Absolutely. you yeah. can do that. So Thank I want to, I want to take some time, you know, this is Vintage House and yeah. he, listen, no, no, no better guest to have on Vintage House is someone who is, is vintage like uh, DJ Terry Hunter, but also like as age like fine wine. Hey. Like you are, you are, you are getting better with time. So I, I mean, listen, I know I've been following you for a long time, and uh, as have many people on the show. So we know you get better, better and better. Like your music is just amazing, and you are probably one of the most prolific, productive producers in the world. Now, and am I am I exaggerating? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to toot my own horn, but I try, I just, you know, the bottom line is, 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 as I think, I just love music so much and I love to wear how my palette has changed over the years and, and just me wanting to dig deep into music. Um, and, and it, it, it's just, I'm a fan of it. And I feel like I fell back in love with it a few years ago. And I told somebody, I feel like I'm like 21 again. And, and Kevin, you you remember those days, man. You was around us when we was trying to figure it all out. And um, I just, I, I fell in love with it again. I fell in love with, with technology. I mm -hmm. fell in love with musicianship. Um, I fell in love with all of that. I embrace the technology. You know what I mean? I'm not one of those that try to, oh, this and this and that, let's keep it real. Like, listen, it's simple mm -hmm. people all the time. They, Big controversy thing years ago, or the sync button. Hey, the sync button is there. If you don't like it, don't use it. That's right. And it's just that simple. So I, I love it all. And, um, you know, I, I was the part of that last generation that got yeah. the chance to experience coming from vinyl. Yes. CD to the computer to the to, to flash drives. And in between what? records, tape decks with a pitch and you know, us using a reel and bringing all of that stuff out. That's so right. I was a part of that era. So can't nobody tell me anything about, oh, you ain't keeping it real because you're using this. And oh, that's why you're good, though. You're it, good because you you evolved with the process. And so you were there at the beginning. You understand how to use all the technology. Absolutely. And it makes you a better DJ. I, I, I feel for folks who haven't had that experience. You know, some yeah. of the younger DJs that I work with, are actually um, using are, are, are using records now. They're like, I want to have the experience you have. You know, uh, I want to understand like what that means to sort of evolve with the technology. And does it make it? Do you think it matters in how somebody DJs if they started on wax and now they're using sticks? What What do you think? No, I don't think it matters at all. I think it's about the music that you're playing, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. think it's about how you play it and 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 knowing your records because I feel like a lot of people. And you can hear it in listening to them, and it's no disrespect, mm -hmm. but people play records nowadays, I think, just because the BPMs are the same. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make one record go yeah. into the next one because it's the same. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I just do know what you mean. It's all yeah, it's just one of those things where you're like, oh, okay, yeah, you blend is good, and then you the energies is just totally off. And I'm all about feel, I'm all about you know, just energy, even if you're not technically the best if those two records and those feelings match so be it i'd rather hear you you know gym shoes in the dry all day versus <laughs> with totally two different records you know you know it's so you you have such an amazing point and i think as djs we can get trapped into um the perfect blend yes and that's 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 kind of a dj thing like you know i mean you can hear when something is off and the best djs you know, actually, the best DJs are the ones who have imperfect blends because they're experimenting. 
You know, they're using stuff that doesn't necessarily have a a a a um a program drum beat. You know what I mean? They're using live instruments, yes. which 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 are are imperfect. Absolutely, they, they are music masters. They know how to blend sound so that you know a dancer is going to hear it and they're going to hear, oh, that's the jam. They're going to be like, oh, that came in sort of off. That's I think it. I lost Kevin. There you go. Yeah, um, so hey, hey. <laughs> he's that, back. That COVID Wi-Fi action going on. No right. worries. No worries. So listen, I want to stop and go back. Yes. Um, so, you know, uh, little Terry Hunter was 10 years old. Yes. Uh, fifth grade or so. Where you go to? Where did you go to elementary school? I went to two. Um, so <laughs> I went to two <laughs> elementary schools. The first elementary school I went to, where I did kindergarten till about fifth, sixth grade. Uh -huh. uh, I went to, which is now called Arthur Ashe on 85th and England. Oh, yeah. But back then it was called John A. Sabarbro. Sabarbro. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. I went to Sabarbro on 85th and Ingleside. And then in those, at that time, um, I was a little wild, I guess, a little hot-headed young kid. And my uh, mother, my mother had me when she was very young, like maybe, I keep forgetting the age. It was 13 going on 14, 14 wow. going on 15. And needless uh -huh. to say, my grandparents raised me. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of cutting up. And um, my grandmother and grandfather was like, no, nah, you coming with us. And so I moved from, I used to live on 82nd in, in, in Ellis, and then I had family on 83rd in Ingleside, so I used to walk mm -hmm. to school every day. And then I moved to a place called Appleville Condominiums, which is on 24th and Canal. Okay. To a school oh, yeah. in Bridgeport, and it's called Robert A. Healy, and I graduated from there. So I did like fifth grade all the way to eighth grade there. Okay. And, now, so, yeah, you. so you were in different parts of the city. That must have been yes. good to experience. Yes, learning a lot was. about the man still. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, we we learn things on Vintage House, you know. Yes, yes, we do. And so, I <laughs> but I gotta ask the question because Sabarbro was a tough school, Ooh. and the the students that went there, yeah, uh, <laughs> represented that toughness yes. full oh, yeah. effect. Listen, let me. I don't know if you guys can see this. You see that? Yes, I see that yes. little car. Yeah, yeah. I got that from. Sabarbro, so and that's what got me shipped to my grandparents. Yeah. <laughs> Needless to say, I have a mark for life from that. <laughs> right, the Perry, Dixon, St. Clotilde. And listen, the Dixon we, and the uh, Sabarbro Ward? Yeah. Kevin, oh my God. Oh, yeah. I had to get that's out. That's hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> and, All right, and so, was, so go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to ask about the school and, and Bridgeport because, you know, mm -hmm. at, at the time, Bridgeport was. Wasn't you know, friendly either. No. <laughs> uh, I'm almost a long racial lines. That was a going there was a, it was a straight up culture shock because I went to a, a all black school coming to going into a predominantly white, Latin, and Asian school because you know we we're right next to Chinatown. And so that was a whole nother experience for me. And so um I think that that in the long run really shaped who I am today with my grandparents putting their foot down, raising me and was like, look, because again, my grandparents were some of my friends' parents' age, mm -hmm. you know, so they were relatively young. You know what I mean? It wasn't a, a, uh, a, a, you know, like your grandparents, you look at them as kind of older or whatever, like, no, my grandfather, you know, when I was younger, they owned a lounge on the West side of Chicago and he was a disc jockey, not like us, but, he played records for the tavern that he owned on the West side. So it was a, just a whole different experience, man. And I think that looking back on things and where I'm in life has kind of opened me up to be able to deal with a lot of the different cultures that I have been fortunate to deal with where I've seen some people, even in the business that first time doing stuff, going mm -hmm. to Europe and adapting mm -hmm. to different cultures, it's kind of rough, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you got a good training and how to yeah. deal with people. Absolutely, um, and that that it's really important, and it's something that uh, we don't talk a lot about. We talk a lot about house music on the South Side, which is a very segregated experience for most of us. I was raised on the South Side. Kevin's raised on the South Side. Orange raised on the South Side. We went to all black schools, 
And we kind of had our own little black bubbles. Yes. And that was an important part of, of creating who we were. Uh, but, you know, there were black kids who had other experiences. Yes. Uh, and and uh, there is a handicap to being to be in, a, in an all in a homogeneous for your entire life. It, it mm-hmm. prepares you for the world, which is not homogeneous. Absolutely. And I, I do know I do know black people and white people and Asians and Latinos who and all you know, many who are handicapped by that. Absolutely. Like they get out in the world and as adults you can tell that, that there's something that's not comfortable in how they deal with other people because they just have not had that experience. Absolutely. And I can see how that might have helped you in, you know, your world travels. Yes, it, it definitely did. And and I swear I thank my grandparents and my mother for it. Um they 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 deceased now, but I, I thank them for grabbing me and was like, oh, no, nah, you finna experience something else. <laughs> 83rd in Ingleside, buddy. Yeah. It's all about exposure, right? <laughs> yes. You wonder, you want want your kids to do something different, put them somewhere else. There you go. You know? You go. So I want to uh, go back to, I know we talked about being 10 years old, but you talked about, uh, you know, in the past, I've heard you talk about that you started DJing at 10 years old. What did that mean exactly? So, like I said earlier, I was fortunate to have a cousin that I was named after. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my mother, again, was very young. When she had me, she was really close with my cousin, by the mm-hmm. way, it's Terry as well. And so at that time. Um, Big Terry. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, Big Terry. Shout out to my cousin, Big Terry. Um, we um, He owned a lounge. And so I was you know, fortunate enough to be hearing all this music and I got a big family, so all birthdays, holidays, we would get together and just play music. And I remember one day, um, I've told this story before, but I don't think I've told it live, but Terry had to babysit me. So Mm -hmm. my aunt grew up in Mary Nook, and Terry wanted to go to this party that was happening up north, Belmont Rocks. Mm -hmm. And Frankie and Andre were spinning. And he was like, look, it's during the day. You coming with me. (laughs) <laughs> and so I just remember him taking me there and we got out there and it was, it changed, it literally changed my life. I'm hearing all of these records that Frankie was playing and I'm like, yo, that's the records that my pops play at home and or mm-hmm. play in the lounge. And mm-hmm. I was like, how is he making these records sound like one long record? Mm-hmm. I, I tell people like only people in Chicago really get this. But when you hear somebody scream your name, all right, Frankie, oh, yeah. all right, Ronnie, it's some, and I'm like, who is this man that they are screaming his name like this? And that just, it, I mean, literally, it changed my life. And I was just sitting there in awe. And this was in late July, beginning of August. My birthday is mid-August. Um, and I just remember flying home, telling my my grandparents, I know what I want for my birthday because they have been asking me. Mm-hmm. Oh, I want a mixer. I want to be a DJ. And that started. That's, wow. that's that's how it went for me. You know, I was wondering about that because I'm like, how's a 10 years old? He's hearing Frankie Knuckles. Now I understand. Absolutely. Because he did day parties and so did Andre. Absolutely. Over, over at the Rocks. Sweet. At the Rocks. <laughs> yeah, the Rocks was, hey, listen. I was 18 years old hanging out at the rocks. That that was the jam. That's yes. we we loved the, the rocks. There was always so much going on. We actually crowded that place out so much that those white people got uh, you know who owned the yacht club that was right yeah. there. Yeah. They're yeah. like, we gotta get these Negroes out of here. They, they were working. <laughs> I'm serious. They talked to the aldermen, they talked to the police department. They were like, it's just too much. It's so too- if you wonder why things move from the rocks to Montrose Harbor, that's why. There you go. See. That history, the council you know. ordinances, they're the best, aren't they? That's it. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So, Frankie Knuckles. So, 1984, you were how old? You were a little bit older by then. Yeah, um, Ter- Terry, M- Marvin Terry, who you who you 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 frequently talk, chat about. Yes. Uh, you know, comes over. You you know wants to wants to get you to open for him. Absolutely. He comes to your house. And uh, says, uh, yeah, I'm going to get you to open for you, but I'm going to, uh, you got to pay me uh, to be on my flyer. Oh, Marvin. So, t- tell me about, tell me about that experience. So I had, um, I was just, I went to Dunbar 
Mm-hmm. And, and um, in the middle of the year, I transferred and I went to Hyde Park, the greatest high school in the world, might I add. Shout out to Hyde Park, career Hyde capital, Park. 88, baby. <laughs> <CA. laughs> so I started DJing. Um, you know, we, we, we had our tapes and we I just found a little crew there and then we started DJing and then um, I did the homecoming. And I remember a lot of promoters came up. John Hunt, Marvin Terry, DeAndre, um, Steve Poindexter, like a lot of those people. And he was like, hey, man, I want you. Can you bring all these people that you have here to my party? I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I'm frantic. I I knew of Marvin Terry, but didn't know. And so he was like, well, listen, this is what you got to do. We're going to do this party at the Humminbird, Humminbird, brother. And um, I got a lot of DJs representing all the high schools. So in order for me to put your name on the fly, you bring your people, this is going to make you a popular DJ and you got to pay me. I remember at that time it had to be $50 or $75. So I was like, well, look, I, I got to talk to my grandparents. I ain't got that type of money. <laughs> I to the house. And he was like, oh, okay, cool. Again, my grandparents were younger. They wasn't the old, my grandfather actually was a, he was almost a little thug. You know what I mean? He, <laughs> he was a street West Side guy. And I just remember, he said, I told my, my, my grandmother and grandfather, I said, listen, I need $50 or $75 or whatever it is. I'm doing this big party at the Humminberg and blah, blah, blah. And I, I'm super, like, excited. He, I was like, he's coming over. He was like, yeah, have him come over. And so he sat down and he talked to, to, to my grandfather. And so he was like, first and foremost, let me tell you this. I know how this goes. So him and Marvin Terry is having a conversation. They know some of the same people that was in the streets. Mm-hmm. He was like, my boy ain't paying you nothing to get on your fly. I'm going to allow him to do this party <laughs> for you for free. But in actuality, you should be paying him for his service. And if he's bringing a crowd in and is bringing these kids and they paying $5 at the door, what are you giving him? Because that money is going to you. Well, it's exposure. He was like, no, nah, you ain't getting that. So this is what it is. So now I'm hearing this conversation and I'm fuming. Like, stuff <laughs> for me, like, ah. And the next thing you know, he told me to come in the front room. And he had, said he was going to put my name on the flyer. And the next day, he came back and dropped flyers off. And needless to say, about 300 people from Hyde Park came to support me. <laughs> and, um, Love it. My journey on getting put on John Hunt from Gucci started coming and started, yes. hey, man, I want to get you to do this at Dealer Sound. And I want you to do this battle with Mark Carmel. And I want you to do this at Scenic Nations and Leo. And it, that's, it just went went through the roof for me. That's a great story. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I love, I, you know what keeps coming up in a lot of these conversations? I, I, I think we in the house music community must have the most supportive parents and, in the world. I know not all of them, not right. all of them, but I hear many people, especially folks who have made a big name in production, who have that foundational yeah. support to help get them there. That's right. um, and, and that's it, not a story you hear a lot. Too. Like, and, and a lot of people don't realize this like big ups and shout out to my brother gene hunt like people don't realize the history that me and gene had when me and gene crossed paths we met each other and gene was starting to really get it as a dj and mm-hmm. gene took me under his wing and i'm gonna tell some funny stories gene hunt used to hate to drive so i used to drive him to his gigs he, he's still and- how, right, <laughs> and that's how I really start getting on on the other level, doing a lot of big parties, was because Gene cuffed me, and me and Gene was together. Like, I mean, you couldn't separate us when we was young teenagers. You know what I mean? He was doing uh-huh. the ball club. That's how I got to do the racquetball ball club. He was doing Sawyer's. That's how I got to do Sawyer's, just because we were hanging out. And I had did that situation with Marvin Terry, so I got I, I got to shout my brother Gene Hunt. People do not realize how, in the beginning, he was very influential in me becoming a yeah. DJ in the city. Gene's name comes up a lot, and Kevin, have we? I know that he hasn't been on my show. Has he been on 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 uh, philosophical he, he, grooves? Yeah, he's been on. Uh, yeah, he has. In the we Gucci gotta have him back. That's yes. right, Jerry. I think you came up to the studio when when. Uh, yeah, you might probably. Yeah, we we gotta have him back. So, 
Listen, basement party was a way to get your name in the street. And we don't, we don't talk about basement parties. And, you know, I get asked that question, like, when did you first start spinning? Mm -hmm. And I always think of like the first time I was at Sours, but before the Sours, there was a lot of basement parties. Like you kind of had to work your way up to that. Talk, can you talk about like, you know, tell us about your, your first basement party, second burst basement party. What was happening? Who was there? Where were you? Listen, my first basement party, we are going to take it back to Mary Nook again. Uh, yep. My cousin Terry and my aunt, when I did that thing at the Hummingbird, I caught the bug and everybody was having house parties. Even a few of the guys that was in my age group around Mary Nook on the south side of Chicago, for those that don't know Mary Nook is around 87th in like Avalon and University. that area. And yeah. uh, I used to stay over there. Yeah, and um, those neighbors. Yeah, it's absolutely. Big Terry. And, we, we was throwing parties, so I just asked my aunt, like, and, and I love my aunt to death, um, my cousin Terry, but she supported me in everything that I wanted to do. And I asked her one day, I was like, and I have a party. Now, she was having parties before that. Uh, Terry was having them, and my other cousin, Lisa, was having parties. And to go back, to go forward, the first time after the Frankie Knuckles experience, we had a party at my aunt's house. Mm -hmm. Brett Moore, I gotta shout him out, was DJing. He Morris. actually taught me how to DJ from DJing in my aunt's party. So okay. that's fast forward. years later, she let me do a party there. And I remember after I did the Hummingbird, it was maybe a month or two later, and we was doing those 99 cent, you know, house parties. And I promoted it. And my aunt was like, do it if that's gonna help you and you're gonna mm -hmm. stay out of the street. Yes. For it. I can control everything that goes on in this house so you Got do it. It. Yeah. and she supported me and i remember doing a party and i swear to you by 9 30 it might have been about 700 kids wow. out on that block trying wow. to and police wow. everything came and so we did a couple of more and we kind of did invite only but that's what i was doing i was doing parties at my aunt's house in her basement and that just took me to a whole nother level how, many, how often would you do that? Like, you know, the basement parties were, were popular, even while we were doing yeah. sours and loft and all that. You know, often you left there and went to somebody's basement. Yeah, absolutely. Party, you know? absolutely. I did them until I couldn't do them no more. I did it for years and not just at my aunt's yeah. house, but yeah. friend's house. You know what I mean? We would just I find do. anybody that had a basement and we would just go set up and we would do a party. So that was my that was my thing, doing the high school stuff, yeah. the basement party. So shout out. That's that's at that time before, because I didn't have, you know, obviously the the, the, mm -hmm. the education that I do now, but I didn't, I thought house, house music came from, because we was throwing parties in people's yeah. houses. Yeah. Yeah. Backyard. Yeah, of course. Yep. That, backyard. Party. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, house parties and, and that's I thought the music came, the, the name came from that. You know, I think that name came from a lot of different places. Like, there is no definitive like answer on this question. But no, I love the basement parties. I want to shout out to Rodney Patterson, who's I don't know if you guys knew Matt Rodney, but he lived over in not far from in Chatham, you know, right. across the street from Mary Nook, and uh, I, we did a huge basement party for him there uh, way back, like 1982. Right. And I just remember like thinking, wow, this. It's amazing that this many people can fit in somebody's basement <laughs> because <laughs> right. I, there must have been a hundred people in his basement, you know, like that probably is not designed for that. But and, and yeah. even then it was it was peace and love and unity. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. All fun, all love, all love. Yeah. So I so I want to move a little bit, you know, uh a little bit ahead of the girls with the, the bobs and the penny loafers and the and the base and the oh, eye shirt. Remember those oh, that God. hairdo? What? Yes, Prep, the preppy handbook. Thing. Right. There's a, we we need more preppy pictures because people people have been asking me about those. I got a request from Honey Dijon because she was uh, putting together something. So if you have some like preppy pictures from that era, would you mind sending them to me or posting them on Facebook? Because whatever she's doing is going to be big. So you know, oh, get God. get hooked up. Y'all know Honey Dijon. Out to Honey, Ooh. yeah. Yeah, I told you that's the show. I'm when you secure she's, her. Yes, she says she'll come on the show. We just gotta, we just gotta find the time. All right, now's the time to do it while we're pandemic. You know, so there you go. Yep, yep. All right, so listen. Uh, you have friends with equipment. 
you have par parents, grandparents that support you, like most producers, you have friends with equipment. Yes. Kenny Jordan had a 909 yes. and a Poly 808. Yes. Am I right? Poly 800. 800. Tell, yes. tell folks what I just said. What am I, I talking about? <laughs> oh, man. Kenny Jordan, and, and especially in those days in 80, like I would say anywhere from, from I'm going to go from my era, 83, 84, all the way up until 88. You know, mm -hmm. in Chicago, we had to make ourselves different and stand out as all the other DJs because we would run into the same, you know, that time it was myself, Armando, Mike Dunn, Gene Hunt. Um, it was just so many of us. Mm -hmm. You would obviously play the same records. and I was kind of looking at that time of, okay, I see what Frankie's doing. I see what Ron is doing. I want to make a record. Like, I want to take this further. Mm -hmm. And so I start making pause edits on my tape deck, uh, learning how to splice reel to reels. Just so if I play the same record, I will play my version that nobody ever had or heard before. Right. And so I go a little bit deeper. And Kenny was a good friend of mine. And he was the only one that I knew had equipment. And he bought himself a 909 and a Poly 800 keyboard. And I remember when he bought it, he called me. He was like, man, you got to come over. You got to come over. I got the setup. I got some stuff. We can make some tracks. Don't know what I'm doing. Figured out how to program drums on the 909. And we sync the keyboard up because we didn't know how to play. Mm -hmm. So we put the keyboard up to the drum machines to where if you hit the drum pads on the 909, it will play the keyboard sounds from the keyboard. Mm -hmm. and the first thing I thought was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And so I was like, huh? Y'all remember that movie? You know what? You know uh, Green movie? Acres? Yeah, Green Acres. Green Acres. <laughs> TV show. The TV show Green Acres. For whatever reason, I must have just watched that before I got over Kenny's house. And all I can do was da dun da dun da dun 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 dun, dun, dun. and I was like, hey, man, this is cool. the inspiration was from, from Green Acres. That That's hysterical. And I didn't know about mixing. All we did was hit play, recorded it to a to a real to real. And I never forget, I remember doing uh was it Racket Ball Club? It was one of those parties I did. It was maybe four thousand kids there. And wow. I, that track. It, no, it was a it was a party that Armando did somewhere I cannot remember, and Navy Pier maybe. No, it wasn't Navy Pier. It was after Navy Pier, I believe. Okay. But I played the record and it went nuts. It went up, and then I was like, "Oh my God, this is crazy!" Like, so at that time, me and Armando, Mike Dunn, we we all hanging out. So after that, Armando was like, "Let's go over Mike's crib." Mm -hmm. I'm sure y'all heard the story. Mm -hmm. Mike Dunn, Marshall Jefferson, they all lived in the same house. It was a studio in the basement. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still not versed on how to really make tracks. I just did this one track. So right. I called Mike. I'm like, yo, me and Amanda went our way over. I'm like, man, I, I, I want you to, like, I need you to make me a track that says my name. And Mike was like, all right, all right, come through, come through. So we went over to the house. We was over there all day. I'm beaten. Marshall up in double dribble. We playing in his room. Mike downstairs working in the studio. So I finally go downstairs. He's like, what you want the track to do? I said, man, I just want you to just put something together and, and just say my name. And this is when sampling was only three or four seconds. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Mike hooked up this drum track, had this ass in line, and just got on the microphone. Terry Hunt. He's like, yeah, hit this button. The track going, I'm Terry Hunt. Terry, 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 Terry Hunt. Terry, 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 Terry Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, my, this it, this it. So again, history with me and Mike Dunn. Yeah. He made my first track with my name in it. I took that track to the party that night, had it on cassette, played it. It went crazy. And that's how I got into producing in like 88, 89-ish. That's fantastic. Uh, I, I loved, I absolutely love the story. And I like how you want to, you know, one of your first objectives was to put your name out there. Absolutely. Like as a producer, you yeah. know, it, it, I think it's important because so many people are waiting to be discovered yeah. when you really kind of have to, you know, 
show your value, you know, like and you gotta understand. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, you had the Farley track, and then you had the Steve Silk, Hurley. Right. Now, it's been a few years. We need to hear a Terry Hunter record now. <laughs> right. let's, let's go That's there. So cool. It was just, you know, from what I was used to hearing, it was like, I thought that was amazing. And at that time, nobody else had did it. And I was like, I need a track with my name in it, because you're going you're gonna to say my name. You're going to say and repeat my name from hearing this track. And yeah. no one is going to have it except me. So that was my edge up, you know? And it goes back to when you said lightning struck, right? When you went to a party at, at the Rocks where you heard people calling Frankie and, and Andre, and you said that was the moment you decided you wanted to be in this. Absolutely, Kevin. And in it you are, my friend. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, listen. I want to talk about Frankie and Andre and uh, Ron Hardy, Ron. you know, some of your early influencers. One of the things that I've heard you say uh, is that they, the songs were structured. Yes. And uh, so what, talk, talk about what that means. What, what would, how would it, what does that mean songs were structured versus what you might hear in an unstructured song? And why were you attracted to that? So even like, and, and, and a lot of that came from, from, from listening to Frankie, but you had records at that time. And, and, and at least for me, I wasn't that versed in music theory, but you had songs that started off and it was one groove and then the verse, it would change into another groove. And then by the chorus, it would be another groove. And then in the middle of the record, it would turn into another groove. And so those particular peaks and valleys in the song I was totally attracted to, mm -hmm. totally, totally, totally mm -hmm. attracted to. And so if guys that heard Frankie, Frankie was very song orientated. Like you could tell when Frankie was playing how he felt by the songs that he would play. And then Ron was just the, the three finger chords, the three finger bass line, but also mm -hmm. incorporated those songs into his set that made him super dynamic and energetic to me. So it was just one of those things that where I wanted to adapt that in my production and early on, um, because I did, I wasn't a musician, like my ear was out of this world. And then at that time I met, uh, me and Ron Trent was hanging out and I met a guy by the name of Aaron Smith and we formed a, 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 a company called UBQ Productions, which in the very beginning was myself, Ron Trent and Aaron Smith. And then Ron Trent went on to do his things, uh, his thing on his on his own. But me and Aaron kind of stuck with it for some years, and and we made some history. And us doing those records kind of got me to start traveling overseas. And so structure was a very big deal. I wanted to know how to put a chord change here, and mm -hmm. and that's how when people early on started seeing, I left the tracks alone because right. UBQ was a little bit more sophisticated at that time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and to that point, you know, a little technicality. Weren't you at one point called Ubiquity, and you shortened it to UBQ, yes. right? Yes. So people, it, it was. I was a major fan of Roy Ayers. Yeah. And I knew his album was called Ubiquity. Right. So I'm like, yo, I didn't know what Ubiquity meant. So it was like, oh, omnipresence, present in the same place at the same time. I'm like, well, that's how I want our music to be to be present in all places at all times. So. In that era, you had the Deaf Mix Productions and this and that. And I'm like, oh, Ubiquity is biting Roy. That's my hero. We're going to say UBQ Mix Productions. And then it went from UBQ Mix Productions to UBQ Project. I love it. And I, I got to insert a little bit of personal privilege here because it was with UBQ Productions that I have had my yes, wife. Sir. And only remix, and I and I thank you always for that opportunity. But I fell in love, baby. It goes yes, back sir. to what Lori said. You are, um, you know, a, a genuinely kind and engaging uh, person, and and the act of kindness that you showed sir. for an inexperienced remixer to Man. put it down on this incredible track. That mix was hot, y'all. Got it. those who's who's watching this, right? Go look. Kevin McFall's makeup of UBQ project when I fell in love is, is super dope. You're right. on it. You're, You're on it. But you know, this is this is why I think uh, Terry is so unique is that I feel like you know a creative genius, and I and I consider you a creative genius. 
is somebody who understands how to pull through inspiration from lots of different sources. So, you know, because we could all sit in our bedrooms and like try to think of all this stuff that's out of our heads. And and that's great. But the, the best geniuses, you know, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, all the people, anyone who you can think of is doing that is grabbing inspiration from oh, yeah. all kinds of places. And they yeah. become like the expert curators. You Absolutely. know, they become sort of a vehicle through which to deliver like like this calibration of, of genius. And Absolutely. and I see you that way, Terry. I think that you do that better than anybody. Thank you so you much. Put that so eloquently, Lori. Um, yes. It, it, it's, it's true. And I, I guess one of the questions that it bears is, you know, you talked about your upbringing, um, you know, with the mix of your grandparents and, and parents and cousins and aunts. Um, was there any, in a, and you can talk about you know, this in the context of the, the genres of, of dance music as one way, but what was the spiritual or church or faith-based mm -hmm dimension of Terry Hunter now or then and now? Well, definitely. So again, my grandparents, I swear they are a, I'm a perfect makeup of them. My grandmother was the most sweetest, giving, loving person um, that you can ever meet. She was the head of our family yeah. and that she instilled that love and showed me how to love and also how to give that back. But then my grandfather was the most giving, loyal, but street knowledge. He would, when I say thug, don't, 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 don't get that as he was a thug, like in the worst way, but he had a very, he comes from a street mentality. He was professional, owned his own business. Um, he coached basketball. People don't, if you remember Crane High School back in the market mm -hmm. days and King days, he was mm -hmm. a basketball coach at Crane. And he also was the head of security at that time for the Board of Education, uh, CPS at that time. So, but he was the street side. He was the one that put that that toughness in me. And my grandmother went to church all the time. So we were definitely in church when I was a kid. And my grandfather, maybe on holidays, Easter, and stuff <laughs> like that. But even right now, I mean, it, it, it's in my heart. I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer of God. My faith is amazing. I don't go to church. I'm not going to front like I should, but um, it, my background comes from my grandparents in, in, in the very beginning of pushing me yeah. to. Right. You don't have to go to church in the black community, though, because the church oh, will come yeah. to you. It's, I mean, you have to, it's like osmosis for us. Like because the church was such a significant uh, part of our of our freedom <laughs> and our ability to move around. You don't have to go to church. It, it comes to you in one way or the other. So I, yeah. It, Without getting too our, deep, I'll just say that. Yeah, our, our community is anchored in that notion or concept of the church, Absolutely. but it doesn't always mean physical church. Absolutely. So, all right. So I want to talk about since we're on church, and we had Carla Prather on here. We've had uh, a few uh, really, you know, wonderful female vocalists, many of whom you've worked with when you helped launch their careers. I, I like to talk about women, you know, in house music because I, I feel like uh, because the field is so dominated by men and the DJ and production part, mm -hmm. we, we sometimes leave out the stories of the women who are essentially the heart of it. Because oh. when we listen to 80% of the tracks, well, maybe yeah. not that much, but when we listen to many, you know, a huge percentage of the tracks, yeah. it's the voice, it's oh. the voices, you know, that we, that we remember. Um, and you've done a, a really great job of, you know, with Teresa Griffin and Carla and uh, Mary J. Blige, uh, you know, Le uh, Lady Alma, of course, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Ari Lords, who's on your label, you know, so many folks who who, who we are, who we know of. I'm, I'm not even naming half of them. Kathy Summers. You gotta get, get Absolutely. <laughs> what? So, you know, I, I'd love for you to, to talk about some of those partnerships um, yeah. and you can talk about what's new or old or, you know, what what draws you what draws you into partnership with with women who you've worked with before, um, and then you know uh, after that I'd love to hear some advice for a lot of these young vocalists mm -hmm. and some of the older vocalists who want to you know stay relevant and back in it. Of course, like for me, I'm a, I'm gonna say this. It's one of those things that I look back on my career and look at all of the women 
like you said, that I have worked with. And, it, you know, let's take Teresa Griffith, for instance. I first met Teresa, uh, shout out to Mary Datcher. She introduced me to her years ago. Very big ups, yeah. And, um, you know, from there, we did a record. People think Wonderful was our first record, but our first record that we did together was called Sunshine. Mm -hmm. And we just hit it off because Teresa was not the type of artist to where she thought, hey, it's my way or the highway or this or that and this and that. She was like, look, you tell me what we need to do and let's do this. And we went in, she, we resung the whole record. We did Sunshine. We put that out and we hooked back up and we did Wonderful. And in between that time, we just, you know, developed a great working relationship. And even mm -hmm. today, it's just, I feel like God put me in the right places at the right times to be exposed to all mm -hmm. these Later on, we went to, to, to do wonderful, toured the world. The record was dead, and we was off to some other stuff. Then all of a sudden, the record stopped blowing up in America. I remember that. Yeah. That record is three years old. I, I remember. I was I was wondering what happened because I remember when it came out, and we played it for a while, yep. and then it just kind of went away, and suddenly it like blew up. And I'm like, what I'm how did that happen? New York and New Jersey, for whatever reason, discovered okay. that record, mm. and that was all she wrote. Like, we was getting messages like BLS is playing your record. And then apparently we got a soft ad at that time on BLS. And we like, yo, this record is, oh, we own this. We over mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We didn't tour. I mean, like we toured all of Europe. The first time I went to Africa, me and Teresa went to Africa together for the first time. Touring mm -hmm. them, I mean, literally all over the world, Asia. And to see that record come back the way it did, Three years later, and now to be a classic, like I feel like if I hit a record again, I'm gonna kill myself. But then, I love it. <laughs> you know I mean? and so it's the same situation, like the chemistry with Jennifer Hudson. Yeah. Yes. It's just all yes. of these amazing singers. You know, I had a great conversation with Maya yesterday. She's back doing some stuff. So I'm That's just cool. in the right places. God has just set me up to be with these beautiful, talented women, and. I'm just accepting my role and to do what I need to do. You know, I, I can relate with you 200%. You know, I got Lori Branch as a co-host, <laughs> Lauren Lowry as a super duper. You're a lucky man, man. Yeah. <laughs> you can you know? I'm happy to be in that club. <laughs> you are too kind. I am equally privileged just to be in your company. So, you know, so back to to uh, to, to women who are trying to, to do this. It, it's not an easy thing to do. What what advice would you give a woman who's watching this show who's a vocalist? I mean, I, you who, let me tell you who, who was in my mind. So I have friends who I worked with, uh, who who are just beautiful. Went to church with some of whom are are around our age, my age. I know I'm a little older than you, um, and and some who are in their twenties who are really trying to come up. What 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 can they do? You know, to really try to uh, to make an impact. Y'all listening? Y'all tell your friends. DJ Terry Hunter at gmail.com. <laughs> Email me. Let me hear a demo and let's go. That's it. And that's all. <laughs> in, in our I, you know, we got hundreds of listeners. <laughs> Craig, Craig Loftus just said he never answers his phone. So I think email might be the better answer. <laughs> hey, Craig, I don't answer for you sometimes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I need I need Craig for something. I'm sorry, Craig. Craig can't gotta do something for me, so I take that back. But no, okay. but I, I just think that um in all seriousness, to advice that I would give is really know your craft. Figure out your voice, know your voice. Push listen, so many people today, I swear all kind of singers, I, I don't understand it. They feel like it's a disrespect or it's beneath them mm -hmm. to continue to get vocal training. Mm -hmm. Get vocal training. The best of them do it. Like, learn your voice. Your voice is an instrument. Learn it. And that's why I feel like there's so many lazy singers today that they don't seek that training anymore. And so that's why you have people like Shante Savage, Teresa Griffin, uh, Jennifer Hudson. Like, I, I, I wish I could have videotaped how that session with, with me and Jennifer Hudson was in the studio, how she was being vocally produced mm -hmm. by Harvey Mason Jr., that's mm -hmm. a legend in this game has had so many hits. Mm -hmm. And then, advice that then Harvey will come to me 
and Wayne and was like, okay, well, what y'all want us to do here? Because they respect the fact that we are who we are in this genre of music. You know what I mean? And I so do. I think that's the that's the key. Learn your voice. Your voice is an instrument. Do training, like do training, do runs, exercise it, and just learn a little music theory because sometimes you get singers that has a great voice but don't really know how to use it. So I'm like, oh, okay, let's do harmonies. Um, what's that? Um, oh, give me a third. Oh, give me. They don't know. They don't yet. know that. They don't know you know that. I mean? So it's one of those things where that's fine, and we can get around that because we have amazing background singers and other singers that could do it. But I would just say, learn your voice. Mm -hmm. learn your voice. So big shout out, Eric Walton's in the room. Louis Green, Melody Diz, Alan King, Alan King. What's up? Congrats hey, on the Kate. new baby, Alan. Yeah, granddad. <laughs> Yes, uh, pop Rest up. Shanks, wow. Brian Pope, thanks, thanks everybody for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Um, I listen, we we have so little time left, so I'm 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 gonna ask a favor. Yes. Can you give us an extra five, 10 minutes? We can do 20 minutes if you like. Ooh, wonderful. Let's okay, go. so I won't keep you all night, but just maybe uh, a little bit past the hour. Let's go. Um, so his he, he, we just about halfway through with what I want to talk about. It this always happens, but I want to talk a little bit about like your your hip hop influence. Yes. Uh, where did that happen? When when did that happen? So that happened in like between eighty four and eighty six. To like people don't know this, I really wanted. I loved house music, right? And mm -hmm. was playing house music, and but I really wanted to do hip hop. Like I really really wanted to produce hip hop, and it was so funny. Um, Another fun fact that, that people may not know is shout to my man, Dion Wilson, AKA No ID. He, at the time when we were kids, he went to Luther South High School and we hooked up. He was DJing him, Twilight Tone, and they're playing house music and, you know, New Rashid then, Common. And Dion was doing house. And I actually hooked No ID up with Amando and he released his first track on. Armando's label under the moniker 326. And people don't know that. And Dion was trying to do house and I was trying to do hip hop. And it went like this. So <laughs> hip hop started working for him because they had common. Right. And the house thing was working for me. But so I, I got in it just loving the culture, loving what those songs was about. Like mm -hmm. all of that. So I really, in the beginning, I wanted to produce hip hop. And are you still doing it? Yes, absolutely. I just released a record. Um, about two months ago on Shantae Savage and Shauna that was with DTP Ludacris. Um, and we did a record that is reflective of what we're going through right now called Tear It Down. So if you guys haven't heard it, go to iTunes and check out Shantae Savage and Shauna. But absolutely, I'm I'm back to producing any, everything that feels good to me. That's and fantastic. That's, that's, that's where I'm at with it right now. See, I was right. Prolific, productive, just, I mean, come on. You yeah. <laughs> you are doing it all. You you, you really show people how to do it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Shantae Savage, one of my all-time favorites. Shantae, if you're watching, I would really want you to come on the show. I would love to chat with you. Um, I'm well. a big, yeah. huge fan. Her voice is beautiful. We can and, um, yeah. Help. Man, I just, I, you know. Um, I used to I used to work at a club called uh, CK's. I don't know if you guys ever heard of it, but it was a girls bar that was open yep. for 30 years. And I was a Saturday night DJ there for about a year and a half. And um, I think it was uh, Bet You Never Find, the, yes. the Steve Sil Curley's remix of it. Yeah. Those people would go nuts for that song. I had yeah. to play it every week for a year. I mean, Wait, seriously, people. you could tell they were waiting for it. Yeah. So that's just one of, what, that's one awesome. of many. I wrote Shantae's first bio too. As a look at you, okay. Well, hey, Shantae, if you're out there, I want you to come on the come show. Come on, on the okay. yeah, we make that happen. That's a phone exactly. call. All right, that's super awesome. Okay, we 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 are planning our shows for like the next two years. I well, we so. always ask our guests anyway, you know, about who's got next, right, Lori? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Terry's all right. So let's move right. on. Um, we have not even talked about your catalog. Yes. We've not talked about your video production. 
Uh, we've not talked about your world travels. Yeah. So I, I want to I want to jump around a little bit and and start with so, sort of your travels. Yeah. I've been listening to everybody's seen the movie Green Book, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't heard of the Green Book till I saw the movie, but like I became obsessed. I like bought a Green Book on off of eBay, and then I listened to the uh, podcast. This, this guy is doing a podcast His name. I'm blanking, and I'll remember. It's hey. a wonderful podcast. Go ahead, Kevin. You, you gotta watch Lovecraft Country. Um, I am yeah. watching it, and that's yeah. so. So that's another reason why I'm obsessed with it. So, okay. if someone was to create a house music green book Oof. for the United States, Oof. like let's take the pandemic out of the picture. Mm. But if there's a place that people need to go to, whether they're performing or it's a club or they got to hear the best DJs, and they are driving around the United States. What would be in that green book? Where should they go? Where would in the United States or yes. in the world? I want to start with the United States and then I'll go to the world. Because we're stuck here anyway right now. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a great question, Laurie. So like obviously we would have to go back because a lot of the venues are not open, but if we could travel back in time, yeah, just mm -hmm. a few years. That's fine. And obviously, I don't want to bring up the legendary clubs like the Music Box and the Warehouse and Sour. Let's, let's travel back in town just a few years. Like few years. Sort of, sort I of will relevant. tell you, Shrine on a Sunday night, yeah. Terry Hunter was a head to be placed. And the reason why I say that, and also Tuesday nights with Mike, but on Sunday, shout out to Reggie Corner, my partner in crime with that is that we did a lot of things and we brought a lot of artists and DJs yes. in Chicago that has never came. And the funny part about it, because that was the reason how we started doing Bang, was that I was traveling all over the world and I was like, yo, I come back home and it's nothing on the level of what I'm used to in Europe. Like, yo, why aren't the big singers coming to Chicago? Like, they would, you know, would come in spurts, but I'm like, I, mm -hmm. I want to change that. And we was the first to bring Black Coffee to right. Chicago. We was the first to bring Boosie. We was mm -hmm. the first to bring Josh, I believe. And okay. It was just so many artists. So I would say definitely the Shrine, definitely just because of, you got a, a, a view of really what the city was with, with Mike Dunn um, on a Tuesday night. I think in New York, you know, you had the shelter, you had... Louis Spot, um, uh, what was the club on? Uh, it just closed. Uh, uh, God, a few years ago, Cielo, Cielo. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but oh, and I'm gonna tell you another spot. If we travel back a few years ago, if we go west to L.A., Marcus Wyatt had one of the best nights I've seen probably in the states for a while. He did early on an event called Does Your Mama Know? Just think about that name. <laughs> <laughs> and I would not started at 12 midnight and went to wee hours in the morning. And then that stopped. And then he also established a brand called Deep. Mm -hmm. And that was some of the best parties. I mean, I was at that point, I was ready to go to, to LA and move. That's how powerful those nights were. Wow. And you got so many, you know, places in Europe, London. So so all right, so now we're at a green book and we're in a plane. Yes. You let's let's talk about the Terry Hunter show. Where yeah. would people find you in Europe? Because you've been all over the place. And and Absolutely. and talk about your favorites. Like what and what you know, what was happening? Well, London um obviously became one of my favorites. One of my friends that I first met when I traveled to London in 89-90, uh, by the name of Warren, he did a club. It was a club in the UK at that time called Heaven. Mm -hmm. But as a smaller room that had about 400 people that was called Strictly Rhythm. And that room, because Heaven was a gay club, mm -hmm. but that room in Strictly Rhythm was, I think it kind of helped shape the scene in London at that time. Mm -hmm. And years later from that, Ministry of Sound. And then for me, one of my best markets where for years, I mean, to this day, I would go to Italy 20 times, 30 times a year, all over the country, wow. up, up and down Italy. 
Switzerland, I held my first residency in Europe. And, and, and that there was, you young and you don't think about it. I used to fly to Lausanne, Switzerland, Lausanne, Switzerland, yeah. every week for six months. So I will fly there. From the United States? From the United States. <laughs> he's Friday like night, day, <laughs> get a gig somewhere on Saturday. Yeah. Come home Sunday, and we'll fly right back and leave Chicago again Thursday to get to Switzerland. And, it and was I like, know you don't like to fly. Listen, oh my God, <laughs> we talked about this. Oh, oh, Lori, I swear. And so, but see, at that time, I was okay. I had a really what really started my my my, my turbulent flight times was literally I had turbulence. I was I did a gig in New York, and I was flying from New York um, to London. And we were flying and we kind of flew two and a half, three hours out. Mm -hmm. Something happened. And long and short, the captain came on and was saying that they was not able to elevate. They couldn't shift gears to, to go higher. And we had to turn around. To oh, land. Okay. And they had to dump fuel because the plane obviously was too heavy. Wow. And as we turned around, coming back, everything was fine. I'm sitting, looking at my seat. Now it's night. I'm like, why is there a light outside in this pitch black dark? We over the Atlantic, you know? <laughs> so the flight attendant kind of gave me a, it's okay. Well, I'm looking at her like, hold on, man. Well, she get, I opened up that window and look, the wing of the plane was on fire. No. Listen, that was the most horrific experience I had and the one thing you you know, people always say, "Oh my God, I bet you people was hollering and screaming for two hours." You did you could hear a mouse fart. It was that <laughs> silent. That's terrifying. And oh my God, I knew it was worse. So it, it end up they dumped the fuel because of the wind. The the, the flames got put out. But yeah. as we were landing into it, it wasn't New York. It was Newark, New Jersey. You're looking, and I'm looking out the window, and there is. Fire engines, ambulance, all oh, kind of wow. waiting for the plane because I know they thought the worst might have happened. Mm -hmm. We landed, and, you know, it was safe, and then we got switched on another plane. And then that, ever since that point for me, if we hit a bump and do like this, I'm like, uh oh, hey, hey, whoa, hey. So it's been it's been rough. You were traumatized. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it hasn't stopped you though, because no. you continue to fly even even through your fear. You white knuckled it, and you uh, continue to be as prolific and productive as as you always were. I, I was seeing you. I was running into you more in the airport than on the street. Sure was. <laughs> sure was. Kevin. Sure was. So, so speaking of being, so you know, listen. Uh, I, I'll get, tell me, roughly speaking, yeah. how many uh, how many tracks have you produced in your lifetime Ooh. as a I don't know, Lori. That's is it? Is it? Is it a hundred, two hundred, a thousand? Where? Where yet? So I'll say this: and I was producing records before Tease Box. Uh -huh. We are upon. We're doing something big. We're upon our hundredth release. Um, in two more releases. Okay. Tease Box, and that's so I also have. Huge. Yeah, man, and so I have Tease Crates and mm -hmm. a new label called Mirrorball. But I, I would say it's well off into. Hmm. Thousands, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, like that's oof. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's amazing. amazing. That is amazing. I'm gonna dig. I want to find that out. I'm, I'm gonna go over my discography. And People are guessing. I want to find uh, this guy has you at about uh, 4,400. This, this one, someone said 35. Reggie Davenport said 300. Okay, so I think we had a contest going. How many? No way. I'm doing 200. No. <laughs> uh, chosen Wait. few. One of y'all should know this. Yes. All right, we got to figure it out because if you Absolutely. if you are hitting close to a thousand, that's yeah. Good. I think I think I'm upwards to a thousand for sure. That's simply amazing. And yeah. I know. Okay, so I, listen, I have been to uh, Terry's studio. He 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 allowed me and my. Let me let me let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. Yes. Let me stop you right now. I'm gonna stop. Go you ahead. Right now. I'm putting this out here to the okay. world. Yes. We are doing this. Okay, Laura. What are we doing? What are we doing? We are getting your uncle, and we're going to My create, cousin. 
it, your cousin, your cousin. Yes. And we're going to create. We ain't going to give it all. Give it to everybody right okay. now. Okay. We're, we're doing this. So I'm putting myself, making myself accountable for all the stuff that I got coming on. We're going to do this project, and this project is going to be incredible. And guess what, people? And I'm gonna give you this. Lori is gonna co-produce it with you. Woohoo! That's what we're gonna do. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's what's up. I you just made my whole year. You know, you should, Lori, I screenshotted your smile. Yeah, you up the whole screen. Wow, that's you know, I'm my stuff accountable now. We're putting this out here to the world. I, and listen, I'm so excited. I am really, really excited. And and I will I will tell you this. I know it will happen because I've been to your studio. Yes. And one of the things that I admired so much, because I've been in a lot of studios, it was so organized. <laughs> I mean, he's got his projects lined up. Like, here's where we are. Here's what's going on. It's like, everything's all written out. It's lined up. I was like, I don't know if he did that for me, but I don't think so. I think that he, I think this is how he gets it all done. Listen, Am I right? It, it, absolutely. And you know what? It's been so crazy in the last few months since we've been on this pandemic. I am a lot more unorganized right now, but you know, that's, I, I got to give a shout to, to, to the team um, because literally without them, I will be through the roof. And first of all, big shout to my brother, DJ Immaculate. People yes. don't realize is that he runs and does a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff for Teasebox and Mirrorball. Um, shout to Black Widow. She's very instrumental in doing our Teasebox chat that mm -hmm. we have and also help run and organize my hopefully we will launch it next year the Imagine no Music Festival that we had a number one record with them but also Wayne Williams doing the A&R I cannot forget my brother Mike Dunn Mike Dunn is so instrumental in helping what you saw with the studio keeping everything organized he's such a tech head and, and is always on me about just that staying organized making sure everything is in place so that right there is a team effort. And then I have to shout out Chosen Few and my brothers, Alan King, that that making sure like, you know, I, I have a situation coming up that legally I'm protected and, and, and just looking over and overseeing stuff besides the day-to-day -day stuff that you know, Mr. AK, the Kang, SNL's very own, but <laughs> you know, that our business is tight. And then I got to shout out my brother, the other light skin with Wayne Williams for just being <laughs> the other light skin one. Yes, and the AR. So it's it's definitely what you saw is accurate. We're a little organ unorganized now due to the pandemic, but we on point. But the team is so important. It's just like with you, Kevin and, and, and Lauren, it's that's a mm -hmm. team. It's it's not Absolutely. one person. That's, that's teamwork makes a dream work. It does. It, it, it honestly does. And I love all of them so much. Like in I can't thank them enough. And shout out to my man, Mo Knows Best, my brand manager, and making sure all the images is good. So I got that out the way. All right. Well, cool. Hey, listen, I, I, I'm with you. I appreciate that that you appreciate the people that support you and lift you up. That's what we got to do for each other. Absolutely. Um, shout out to uh, Aaron, uh, Lauren, Eric Welton. Thanks for tuning, tuning in. Tony Sundance Evans. Uh, Celeste, my sister, I see you. I love you. Thank you for watching us. Um, all right, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap up a little bit because I'm really keeping you over. No, you're not. I do. Let's go. All right, so I, so I want to ask you uh, about you know uh, so sort of like this idea we call it in our and I work for a corporation and we call it work life balance. Okay. Um. So I know I know because I saw it on your board. You've got 20 projects going in your head at any given time. Absolutely. You are producing video. You are the CEO of a company. That means you got employees, you got singers, you got a lot of people coming at you for a lot of different things. How do you, what we call work-life balance? Mm -hmm. You also have a family. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you balance all of these things and, and stay sane and happy and healthy? You know, it's it's hard um, because sometimes you can get so, especially with the traveling. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just remember one time, like late 2019 i was completely exhausted and i'm like nah man like i can't do it, it was just to the point of when i was traveling i told my agents i can't fly to europe to do one gig anymore mm -hmm. if it's like at least three or four days i'm not doing it it's because 
it's exhausting. Like imagine people, and a lot of people think it's it's, it's fun, but imagine yeah, that's right. You know, it's not. I mean, even in business class, it's still on a plane. I remember yeah. last year before AD, I had a gig in Angola, and I flew from Chicago to Ethiopia, had a connection in Ethiopia, and then had to go over to Angola. Mm -hmm. Did some production work there, studio work. Then I left there, had to fly from Angola to Spain. Spain one day did a gig, then fly over from Spain to Amsterdam for ADE and was up all day and all night and then come home. When I got home on that Sunday, I literally passed out. And yeah. so that was the thing of, Terry, you're doing too much. Slow down. Yeah. And um, from that point, it, it, I just got to, I, I got to become a family man. I have a son, I have two kids. My other son is grown and I have a wife. I have a family. I have to be more accountable. So the great thing about it was when I'm working in the studio, my studio is at home. So I'm downstairs or upstairs from them. And uh, we're right there. But again, I've had people come in and come out of, you know, my my work situation. Mm -hmm. And I think. Right now, the balance of the team is amazing. And so when you say videos, it's good to have. Like my grandfather always told me, and shout out to my brother Jazzy Jeff, by the way, we have a number one record with him out now on Mirror Ball. But it was always, I heard my grandfather say it in different words, but I've always heard Jeff talk about that. It's just get somebody on the team that does something that you don't do. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes a great team. And mm -hmm. the stuff that Immaculate does. The stuff that Mike Dunn does, the mm -hmm. stuff that Danielle and Wayne and Allen does, I don't do. It's like we are a team. I'm running point. There's my two guard. There's my two power forwards. There's my – and we all have this common goal of putting that ball in the hole and scoring for the team. G, G money. Yes. yes. I, I appreciate the way that you put that because, listen, we're not getting younger. No. And uh, there's a lot of stress in this community. You know, you do this full time. Other people do it part time. Some people do it sometime, you know, but however you're doing it, if you're in the music industry, you know, whether it's your, your full time work or part time passion, yes. uh, it can be stressful. Because yeah. you're always trying to stay relevant, you're always trying to, uh, for, you know, sort of exercise your artistic, you know, uh, muscles, and yeah. you and you want to uh, you want to be loved, you want to be taken seriously. Yeah, uh, that's stressful. It's stressful being a black artist. It's stressful being a woman artist. It's stressful being a 50 year old plus artist. Hello. I mean, let's keep it real. And so what happens is, and we're seeing this. Uh, there's there's this book called The Fifth Inning. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that, but this, this, a, a black author wrote this years ago who was saying, he starts seeing a lot of his friends start checking out in the fifth yeah. inning, 50 yeah. years old plus, wow. because you can't sustain that lifestyle that you had in your 30s and 40s in your 50s and 60s. No, you cannot. You cannot sustain it. And often, you know, we're going and going and going. Our diet falls off. Our exercise falls off our ability to maintain balance falls off. And then we wonder why people are in their fifties having, you know, major serious health, adverse health mm -hmm. outcomes. Absolutely. So I, I want to put in a plug for work-life balance to you, to Kevin, to everyone who's watching, because that is ultimately, you know, what's going to give you uh, a long and happy life. That's that. I swear to God, you got to text me that work-life balance. I yeah. absolutely love that. I absolutely love that. It is so very important. It is crucial. And yeah. so, especially mm -hmm. when when the energy and the output um, is at such a high level, right? Yes. You, yes. You're, you're bringing all of yourself to every project. And yeah. um, that can be draining. And I, I think the opportunity for um, the audience, right, listening tonight, is to um, hear what you have as, as thoughts about, you know, what the broader house community, particularly, you know, Chicago-based mm -hmm. contributors to this, this genre, what do you think is, is missing or is still needed 
to help this community continue to thrive. How many more minutes you said we got, Lori? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, they're not going to cut us off. I think we can go for a while, but I don't want to keep you all night. I know we got to go. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, you know, the one thing, and I try to keep cool about it because anybody that know me, I don't jump to social media with uh, personal stuff. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm being told by E and Immaculate and, 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 and my man Mo, you, know, you got to post more, you got to do this, you got to be more engaging. And the one thing that I think with Chicago, and I'm sure you guys have had it on the show, I'm a fan of the show. I watch the show every chance I get. Thank you. One thing, yeah, appreciate it. one thing, the absolutely one thing is this. I don't understand how people are using their platforms on Facebook and Instagram to be this late in the game to be so bitter. So what I think we need is, and I don't know right. if we will ever get there. And it's clusters of people that get along, but the, 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 the hate that is being translated, the, 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 just the negative posts, the negative comments about DJs, who was there first? You didn't go to this party. You wasn't at that party. You didn't do this. And this person ain't that. It's just tearing down, tearing down, mm -hmm. tearing down. And that's why I'm just like, yo, at the end of the day, I don't get involved in it. And if that's I do get involved in something, it's a situation where there's a personal attack and I need to address it. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I just stay away from it. And it's a shame because I'm going to say it. Chicago has so much talent. And you guys that's doing it, you know who you are. You're mm -hmm. not even looking at your talent. Your talent mm -hmm. is next. The, the BS is first. And I just wish that we could just somehow stop tearing each other down for self reasons. You want to see. It's like some of these people just to see their name out there, just to see, put their name on the record on the fly, the DJ here, to say they mm -hmm. DJ there. They don't care about, you know, they just want to see their name. I don't understand where this mentality came from. And so I just want to say to answer your question, I just would like to see us stop stealing, stop hating, mm -hmm. stop downing the next man, and especially mm -hmm. in, the, in the black community. You know what I mean? We have to, listen, all these cats out here, hey, hey, you ain't put me on and this and this and that, and you ain't did this, and everybody feels entitled. That's the thing. They feel so entitled. No, we work for this. No, I'm not. I'm a new DJ. You a new DJ? You 49. <laughs> well, what do you mean you new? It's not new. So my whole thing is like, let's just stop all that. Like, when did it become so important where everybody's the DJ now? Nobody's a dancer no more. No one likes to go to the parties, just to party. You want to go to the parties to talk about what he planned or talk about why he in that position and you not in that position. Yeah. And we, we, we lost it to me. And I just yeah. think that's why I focus on who I focus on with my team yeah. and try to take that. I mean, look at Immaculate. You know what I mean? I'm not saying, because he got to have some talent. But when we hooked up, I'm like, I'm going to take you from here to here because I know you want to get it and you have talent. Yes. He didn't say, hey, man, this, why, why this person here? Why this person there? It's just to me, I just think that we got the baddest DJs, musicians, Mm -hmm. world. Let's even go there for major artists, right? Beyonce. Yeah. Uh, let's just, anybody you can name up. Mm -hmm. Most of all they musicians come from here. That's Chicago. amazing. They come from Chicago. So it's like, I just want us to get it together. And I think it's healthy and positive to ask these questions. And I think if it only affects one person, that was one person that's been affected. And that's it. But I just really hate to see the state of where we are right now with just mm -hmm. trashing each other on social media. And the world is just sitting back like, that's what they're doing if y'all don't believe it or not. It's like Chicago messy. Right, messy. Yeah. <laughs> messy. So well, I try to stay yeah. away from that mess. Yeah. I align myself with people like you, Lori, and you, Kevin, and we talk about positive things. And that's right. This guy's doing positive things and has shared so many like like and this is a true story that i've had a couple of friends hit me from all over the world that watch the show and see reruns of it and uh -huh. knew who certain people were that we like oh wow yeah we took them for granted mm. 
because of this show, you guys expose them. So let's thank you. Let's just keep on the on the on the up and and, and positive notes like that. But that it it has to be. I answered your question, Kev. All right, you <laughs> did, you did, and and we're committed to to that goal and mission. We want to capture the stories, yeah. the perspectives, yes. right? Because ultimately, this is our thing, and it is our narrative uh, that we can't let anyone else control, right? We, we got to control it. And it's it's also our way to share positive energy because I, I believe exactly as you do, Terry, that I, I am not going to feed uh, negative energy. So okay. when I see that posted, I do not respond. You know, if it's something personal, you know, certainly I'll deal with that person. Absolutely. Um, but I'm not going to feed it because the more you feed it, the more it grows. Absolutely. You feed the things you want to grow. So I'm going to feed love. I'm going to feed support. I'm going to feed people who are kind and generous like yourself and like, you know, the people that 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 we that we appreciate and who are helping Chicago to have a good name and not the messy. Name. Hello. Hello. And let me say one other thing about that. If you uh, and if you're listening to this and you search your mind and you know that you put negative stuff out there, it is like a cancer. It is. It's like a cancer to to the community, but more importantly, it's like a cancer to you. That kind of stuff erodes your soul, and what you reap, you sow. So the more you're saying, "I'm not getting," that's the stuff you put in the universe. You won't get it. So, so I, I want to repeat what you said, Terry. Let's knock it off. Let's let's reel it in. Uh, do what you need to do. Pray, meditate. You know, uh, drink whatever. You know, don't drink. <laughs> Get used to herb. Whatever it takes. Calm the heck down. And before you write that negative thing, just think about it. Think about how it's going to affect us. How it's going to affect you. So uh, on to that, a positive note. I listened to G DJ Jazzy Jeff's song. Thank you, uh, Tease Box, because yeah. it is a jam. I love it so much. Playing it right before you came on. I was trying to figure out how to integrate it. But what do you have? Uh, there's a lot. I know you got a lot working on, but talk about what's happening now. What do you want people to know? Yes. Um, what do you want to promote? Yes. And, uh, what can we all do after we get off off of this uh, this this live feed? Yeah, so I think everybody knows about my label, Tease Box. Again, uh, look for something special. We're putting a, a nice little compilation together to celebrate the 100th release on Tease Box. Um, we are hoping, no, we are going to do a small documentary kind of touching on stuff from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Look to that. Um, I started a new label. Uh, we're on our, I think of Emacs there, our sixth or seventh release, which is the Jazzy Jeff record. Um, but the label is called Mirrorball. And Mirrorball is the label that I kind of wanted to focus on to where we could kind of put a lot of stuff out, not just really house, but mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that has, you know, live musicianship. Um, even if it's an R&B record, uh, 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 an 80s sounding record, a disco sounding record, I wanted to be, I wanted to Mirrorball to be that label that represents that time and that sound. So I'm really happy uh, to, to, we just had a number one now with Jazzy Jeff. Shout out to my brother, Jazzy Jeff. Also Melba Moore. Um, shout out to Immaculate. Great. Black Widow, another number one with Love yes. Festo. Mm -hmm. The um, video is out. Go get that. It's so much stuff uh, happening. The records with Mike Dunn that we're doing. We got some house and HD projects coming out and let me make this clear it's funny we've been doing a lot of streams and people thought house and hd was like house and high definition is mm -hmm. hunter and dunn our last name so we did a playoff for that okay and, um i'm just looking um i looking forward to really planning my my my, my uh birthday next year yeah. uh august but before that you know everything that we're doing we're doing so much stuff with the chosen few djs we all got our streams going, so shout out to all my children, a few brothers. Um, I have a show, Sanitize Your Soul, on Thursdays. Yeah, so y'all check that out five to seven. And you got Alan, and then Wayne is at the first of the month, and Mike Dunn is kind of in between trying to figure out how he's going to get back into it and what day he's picking. And Immaculate is working on a project with me. It's so much stuff. Um, my album, 
Lord Jesus has been there. <laughs> and then there's an album. <laughs> and then there's an album coming and that's been going. So I think we are finally about to get on the right track with getting this album uh, released in 2021. And hopefully we'll get a single, but I got a lot of inspirational features on there that I'm so looking forward to. Now, so it's not in I the see a Grammy yet. in your future. I see a Grammy in your future. Oh my God. Lori, come on. I do. Keep putting these jewels I out I see here. it, man. I, I, I see it. I receive it. it. I receive <laughs> it. Is, is the album done and you just haven't released it? You're still... So the album is pretty much done. It's not mixed yet. Okay. But the songs and everything are recorded. Um, but nice. it was I'm um, in a deal and we were having some differences on a major label. So I don't want to put that out there yet until I know that's rock solid, which should be by the end of the week. Okay. But um, songs are done. We just have to mix and master mm -hmm. and a couple of more we gotta record, but I can tell you I have Estelle on a song. I have Common on a song. I have Raheem Devon on a song. Oh. Like it's Mike Dunn on a song. This um, is next level stuff. Yeah, it's and it's a couple that's of great. people out that's really big, but I'm going to let that be a so, surprise. So, you know, the Brenda Child Show has this reputation for enabling um, breaking news opportunities. So <laughs> yeah. when you're ready... Not forcing yeah. anything tonight, but when you're ready, you got to. I was gonna say that earlier because Lori was like, "We are booking talent all the way up." Listen, I need yeah. to on the show. I got some more stuff we need to talk about. So anytime, for me, you know, any time, dude. Okay. You are welcome every me. week. Yes, I love it. So I love it. I, I love it. I just have one um, philosophical question, though. Um, Come on that, that's not really. <laughs> it, it's in the context of your mantra imagine no music I, yeah. I i just wanted to ask if you could spend 30 seconds breaking that down for the audience so i started so what i was thinking when i first started my album and i and, and to me i'm one of those guys that i process things a lot think about things and i didn't want to put in this climate an album together to where people we're going to just kind of pick the songs. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of albums in the last few years have just been a collection of songs and not an album. And I wanted to have, and I'm going to have interludes in the album, certain songs that just are not what you expect. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, before I got started on an album, I needed to come up, what am I going to call this? Like I wanted something that meant something to me. And I remember spending months having countless conversations with Mike Dunn and, you know, me and him bounce so much stuff off of each other and Wayne. And I was just like, man, I can't start this album. This was a few years ago. And I was like, somebody said to me in a conversation, man, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have music. And I was like, wow, imagine no music. Boom. There it is. <laughs> Love it. That set up the first one. I'm not going to tell you guys what it is, but when you hear the album, the very first song, when you hear that, it is not what you think it is. Mm -hmm. and that right there, I said, this is the first song on the album. Now I can start laying the foundation and putting the rest of the songs together. So my radio show in England is called Imagine No Music. Okay. Um, House of Film. And, and it, it's just powerful and i tested it out traveling in mm -hmm. the airport, i would have my shirt on imagine no music and so i knew i had something when people was just like oh wow i can't oh wow great shirt oh wow i can't like i said oh, <laughs> of course i got something y'all you do and have something when you really think about that just imagine if we did not have music what kind of world of society would we be with depressed <laughs> yes Yes, expression. Music, music is what's getting us through this pandemic. Let's Come keep on. it real. Come There's on. a reason why people was getting thousands and thousands of views on their lives, especially in the in the early part of it, because it was like, oh, it's like helping me breathe. Yeah. Well, listen, that. Terry Hunter, uh, yeah. you've been very generous with your time. Uh, I, I want to thank you so, so, so much for being a part of this discussion tonight. 
uh, we could go on and on. So for we that could. reason, we're so just going to have we get the most slots from that on because we haven't even. I know. The I know. Well, that's the thing. We have scratched <laughs> the surface with this. It's I know. I know. Perfect. But that's we like to do this with I, you uninterrupted. We're going to do it again very soon. Um, and I, I want to figure out, Kevin, and 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 and, and everybody that's on here watching, mm -hmm. like in all serious seriousness, we need to figure out. We need to get this show nominated. We need to get some the power to be because I have been interviewed a whole lot, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And I, Kevin, been knowing you for years. Lori, been knowing you for years. And I swear to you, I've been on the show with you, Kevin, before. And Lori, when we have conversations, we just go on and mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you guys for doing this. Like, I swear, I know you guys hear it, but we need to figure out, you guys need to be nominated for best, like, I don't know what's the category, the best <laughs> documentary series, internet series. I don't know if that's the right words, but y'all know where I'm getting at. But y'all yeah. are incredible. Lori, you look amazing. I told oh, you before, thank you. And some of these people that's out here that's been doing this forever, they, they can't touch y'all. Like, and I sit back and I'm like, damn, how do you have a career in radio or TV? And you're like, you suck. <laughs> you can't the now, my people here, hey, we we gonna we gonna figure this out that y'all have to. Wow. Have Our super duper producer says yes. Heart yes. fire. She's Absolutely. all about it. Lauren, Lauren Lowry is her baby. Yes. She adopted us. And where's uh, Lauren? I'm mad Lauren ain't on here when I'm on here. Where's Lauren? I don't know where she is. I'm mad. The next time I come on here, she got to be on the show. I'll be just right. on there for everybody else. We, we, can, we can make that happen. We can next time. Happen. Next time. Well, I'm Terry. Teasing. I'm teasing. Terry, thank you so much. I mean, that that means the world coming from you. You are, you right. are really uh, just a delightful person and a, a wonderful, spirited human being and your generosity is um it's so it's so hard it's so from the heart and it's just so meaningful and profound and i just appreciate you i appreciate your whole team eric chosen few all the people that you named uh thank you for supporting this brother thank you for supporting them thank you for supporting our community Absolutely. um so we will have you back yes uh and i will be in touch me and my cousin we gonna have a little that's my mm -hmm. man. So I can't wait for the knowledge for him to drop on the world. Oh my God. Yes, uh, he's got a lot. <laughs> yeah, he does. Thank you guys so much. Megan, hey. you already know, bro. Yes, sir. I thank you. Chicago. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like we appreciate it, it. this. This is home. So this means a lot. You know what I mean? This is this is this is home, man. So shout out to yeah. everybody in the city of Chicago. I love y'all and ain't nothing you can do about it. That's, it. That's right. All right. Peace, everybody. We'll see you next week on Vintage House. That's right. Nine o'clock. Good night.